You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. When a person says, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins, rose from the dead, I believe he is Lord, there should be fruit. If there's no fruit, then we have no reason to believe that the Holy Spirit has worked in their life. And Jesus said this in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Oh, Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say. There's a problem there. So faith and obedience go hand in hand. The fact is we obey those who we love, right? We really do. And we obey the Lord because of that. How do you identify certain plants and trees? In winter, many trees could pass as doppelgangers. If you wanna know what type of tree you have in your backyard, look at what it produces. Maybe you'll have lemons or maybe peaches. Perhaps your tree will produce walnuts or acorns. In today's message, Pastor Ron teaches that much like plants, people can be identified by what they produce. Are you producing fruits of the world, like lying or selfish ambition, or are you producing fruits of the Spirit? Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of Romans chapter one as he continues his message. The Gospel, God's Good News. So Jesus is his name, Christ, Messiah is his title. But then we also see that he's called Lord. And that's simply a description of his authority. That Greek term is curious. It means to have power. It's sometimes translated master. I mean, that makes sense because Jesus is God. He's the master over everything. Hence, he has all authority. So the name Jesus, the title Christ, his realm, all authority, everything. Now, moving on, Paul shows us in the rest of this verse, and even into verse 4, that Jesus is the person which the gospel centers. And he gives us two proofs here that Jesus is the fulfillment of the good news that, that was promised back in verse 2, and that he is fully man and fully God. So notice it says, continuing in verse 3, speaking of Jesus Christ who is Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. So again, we already referred to it, but the scripture said that Jesus would become a person, a real man, born according to the flesh. Now listen, all the Jews knew, as it says right here, that Jesus or the Messiah would come through the lineage of David, right? Right? We read the account in 2 Samuel chapter 7. David is sitting in his palace that he made. You know, he's conquered the Jebusites. He's taken over what we now call Mount Zion. He's established his kingdom. He builds this beautiful palace, and he's sitting there and going, man, I have this beautiful palace, but God is dwelling in that tabernacle, the tent. That ain't right. Nathan, come here. Let me tell you something, Nate. I think that we, I'm going to build God a house. And Nate goes, that's cool, man. Do what's all, whatever in your heart, bro. I like it. God's going to like it. But that night, God speaks to Nate, Nathan, and he says, no, 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 you, you spoke presumptuously. You need to go to David. I, I'm glad. He has a good heart, but he has shed too much blood. He cannot build me a house. But you tell him, you go tell him, I'm going to build you a house. Far out, I'll tell David. So Nathan goes back the next morning, uh, next morning, David, I have some good news and I have some bad news. The bad news is you can't build God a house. The good news is he's building you a house. And, and what it meant is I'm going to establish your throne. Through you, the Messiah is going to come. Wow, what an amazing thing. So everybody knew that the Messiah would come through the line, the lineage of David. As we read here in verse 3, Jesus was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. So he actually came through the line as a real person, 100% man. Hebrews 2.18 tells us he had to be made like man in every way. So as we go through the Gospels, he ate, he drank, he slept, he was tired, he wept. He was 100% man. And this is why the scriptures call Jesus the son of man. But then there's a second proof that he's the Messiah. And he's also declared, verse 4, to be the son of God. So son of man refers to his humanity. Son of God refers to his deity. And how do we know Jesus is God? Well, of course, we could spend all night. There are many proofs. 
But there's one great one that he declares. He's declared to be the son of God with power. What kind of power? With power according to the spirit of holiness. What does that mean? It means in conjunction with the nature and the work of the Holy Spirit. The son of God. He's the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness proven. Here it is, by the resurrection of the dead. It, it, I mean, Jesus did many miracles. He even raised the dead. But it's one thing to raise yourself from the dead. Jesus said in John eleven twenty five, 25, I'm the resurrection and life. He who believes in me, though he dies, he will live. And he could say that because he is the resurrection and the life. And so he proves it in his birth, in his death, in his resurrection. So Paul just, starting off with this book, he just wants to lay some things out. He introduces himself as the preacher of the gospel. He talks about the promise of the gospel. It's not new news. This has been since the beginning of time, but it's fulfilled in the person of the gospel, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, in the final verses I want to look at, we're going to look at the provisions of the gospel, and we're going to see um, quite a few of them. And he begins that through him, verse 5, we've received grace and apostleship. So right off the bat we learn about two provisions. The first is grace. And Paul reminds us here that it's through him, that's Jesus, that we receive it. We can't do it on our own. In fact, you might even say uh, the gospel, which is the good news that comes from Jesus, the gospel and grace are synonymous. The gospel is all about grace, and grace is all about the gospel. In fact, in Acts 20 and verse 24, the gospel is called the gospel of grace. Isn't that interesting? They're really together. Now, we've talked about what grace is before, but I simply want to remind you uh, what it is, if you don't know that, if you haven't heard me illustrate it. But I, 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 I compare it, first of all, to justice. Justice is getting what we deserve. So if you go, you break the speed limit, you get a ticket, a trooper pulls you over and says, Mr. Hint, you've been speeding Again, I mean, I've used that illustration a lot of times, so I guess I'm speeding a lot. I don't know. And uh, I get a ticket. Well, justice has been served. There's no need to argue about it. There's no need to fight about it, right? I'm guilty. I'm guilty. And I've been pulled over before. It's like, yep, <laughs> give me the ticket. I, mm -hmm, it doesn't lie, you know. Now, I'm thankful that God doesn't always deal with us according to justice, I mean, some, sometimes, I mean, I see it on, I've seen it in movies, and I, I, but I've never said it. My golly, I want justice. I, uh, no, thank you, not me. <laughs> because if justice served, I, I deserve death and judgment. But let's say that you plead with the officer, please, sir, I, I, I mean, I wasn't paying attention. Whatever it is, you come up with some kind of lame excuse, or you really weren't paying attention. You're just honest. And you say, could you just be merciful to me this time? And you know what? He says, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm not going to give you a ticket. And, and that's mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. You deserve a ticket. You didn't get it. And God gives us mercy. I deserve death. And God extends it, mercy. But, but grace goes way beyond that. Because if the police officer pulls me over and he says, you deserve a ticket. You were speeding. But you know what? I'm not going to give you a ticket, mercy. But then he says, you know what? I had just gone down and I bought a brand new car. And I'd like you to have it. I just, you just seem like a nice, oh, here's a brand new car. You say, that is totally outlandish. That's just a ridiculous example. I just want you to know that's just how ridiculous our salvation is. How ridiculous. Because I deserve death. And Jesus says, I'm going to take your place on the cross. I'm going to die for you. Die for you. I'm the Lord of glory, and then I'm going to give you all that I have. Everything I am, you will receive. Oh, my goodness. Are you, that just seems too good to be true. It is too good, but it's true. That's the thing. In fact, listen to what 2 Corinthians 5.21 says. For God made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us. So he, be, he took my sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. So God looks at me, and now I'm righteous. That literally means to be made holy. Are you kidding me? So the gospel is certainly all about grace, right? 
Salvation doesn't come through baptism or confirmation or communion or a church membership or church attendance or church activity. It doesn't come trying to be a good person or doing good works. It comes simply when I come broken, I say, Jesus, would you forgive me of my sins? I believe you are the son of God. I believe that you died for me, that you're the way, the truth, and the life. It just comes through simple faith. And God says, yes, you're now my child. Wow. So God, so the provision of the gospel is the greatest is grace. But it goes beyond grace. There's another provision, and he says here, apostleship, apostleship. Now, Paul opened up the letter calling himself an apostle, chosen directly by Jesus Christ. I would say that's an apostle with a capital A. But we also said the term was used in other places to refer to one who's commissioned. It can even be translated an ambassador. So The truth is, you and I are called to be ambassadors for Christ. By the way, it says that in 2 Corinthians 5.20. You are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. I'm to be his witness. I'm to be his missionary. I'm to be his light. I'm to be salt. So think about this. Jesus never converts somebody or anybody without commissioning them. When When you're called, you're commissioned. When you're saved, you're commissioned. So wherever God has placed you, you're commissioned. Yeah. You've been commissioned to be light, to be the salt of the earth. So if you, you, know, you work at the bank, you're light at the bank. If you work at the grocery store, commissioned to be light in the grocery store. You work for you know, an accounting department, you're, you're the light at that accounting department. You're commissioned. You're, you're an apostle, right? He says, we've received apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations for his name. That tells me something that I'm, I'm not saved to be silent. That's what that tells me. I, I, I'm saved to speak up. I'm not saved to stick my head in the sand. He, he says, for obedience to faith among all the nations. Isn't that amazing? You know, when Jesus saved the disciples and commissioned them, he, he didn't say, so now go, I now baptize you. Now go into the desert and just get away by yourselves. He doesn't say that. He said, now I want you to go, and I want you to tell everybody. In fact, even before he left, he got them in groups of two. Now go out and start doing the work I'm doing. Come back and report. Tell me what's going on. Oh, man, Lord, it's awesome, you know. We saw this happen, and this happened. They got so excited. Jesus says, I know, that's pretty exciting. But listen, what's better than that? Your names are written in the book of life. That's even more amazing. But the reality is, is we're not saved to sit around and do nothing, but to let our light shine. So when somebody, if you ever ask somebody and say, are you a Christian? And they say, well, you know, that's between me and the man upstairs. <laughs> no, it's not. It's between you and everybody. If you're a Christian, everybody should know you're a Christian. So I like 2 Corinthians 5, 15. It says, uh, for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are saved and among those who are perishing. So we're to be a fragrance of Christ among the believers and unbelievers. So now you think of fragrance, I always think of something, you know, that smells sweet, smells good. Oh, man. They, and some people, you know, you could smell their perfume far before they enter the room. So I put on a little bit too much there. But, but that's how people should know. I, I also like to think of a fragrance. Think of that, that. Now, some of my favorite fragrances are fragrances of food, to be honest with you. So I, I just think of Thanksgiving, you know, coming to a grandma's house or something. You smell, man, that smells awesome. Man, the, whoo, I like that. Let's have some of that, you know. And I just think, what is that, what, that would be a great fragrance because when I'm around people, people should want to taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? So... Either however you want to think of a fragrance, we are the fragrance of Christ. We're his representatives. Among all the nations for his name, verse 6, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. Now, that word called simply means it's another term to say those who are Christians. Now, one more thing before we get to verse 7. Very important again. He says back in verse 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship. Notice for obedience to the faith among all the nations for a name, so forth. I, 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 just, I like that phrase right there, for obedience to the faith. Paul links faith and obedience together. Now, it's very important. How are we saved? Well, we're saved by grace through faith, period, yes. right? Yes. But the Bible does also teach us, and Paul does here, that obedience and faith are inseparably linked. 
You really can't have one without the other. So when a person is saved, they'll give evidence of their salvation through their obedience to Christ, right? I mean, just consider the Great Commission. Again, we were just talking about how we should let our light shine and we're commissioned. So Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says in verse 20, teaching them, here it is, to observe all things I have commanded you. You need to be instructing them to walk in obedience to me. That's part of being a discipleship, right? Yes. So the gospel isn't faith plus obedience equals salvation, no. The gospel is faith through, grace through faith, period. But genuine faith is seen in evidence through what it does. Or as James puts it in James 2.20, faith without works is dead. So it's faith alone that saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. Maybe that helps, right? So when a person says, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins, rose from the dead, I believe he is Lord, there should be fruit. If there's no fruit, then we have no reason to believe that the Holy Spirit has worked in their life. And Jesus said this in Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Oh, Lord, Lord. But you don't do what I say. There's a problem there. So faith and obedience go hand in hand. The fact is we obey those who we love, right? We really do. And we obey the Lord because of that. All right. So thus far, we've seen two provisions of the gospel, grace and apostleship. Now, there are three more found in verse 7. Now, Paul starts off by mentioning the recipients of the letter. I already talked about that to all who are in Rome. But then he says this, beloved of God. And there's the third provision I see of the gospel. Through faith in Jesus Christ, Paul called these Roman believers, and he calls us beloved of God. When God says that, that means you're close to the heart of God. There's only a few people in the Bible that God ever said that to. One of them was Daniel. On three occasions, God said of Daniel, you are beloved. And then you come to the Gospels. And you know who else God said that to? Jesus said it about John. John was the beloved of God. So this term was not used flippantly by God. However, think about this. As a result of Christ's atoning work on the cross, when a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ, God calls them beloved. Isn't that awesome? Think about how much God loves us if he calls us loved ones, sons, daughters. You know, John couldn't ever get over that reality. And it really comes out when he says this, when he writes in 1 John 3, 1, Behold, or can you believe it, what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we could be called children of God. He's just like, he's like, I can't even believe that, right? As a Christian, we're special to God. We're beloved. We're, we're the apple of his eye. You know, the Bible tells us in Psalm 139, it's a great psalm, but it tells us in that psalm about, among many things, that God's thoughts towards us are more than the sands of the earth. Now think about that. So think about that the next time you go to Galveston, or hopefully another beach. <laughs> And you put your hands in the sand, you know, and you grab a handful of sand and, and try and start counting just those grains that are coming off. You, you, would, you would stop. You wouldn't even get halfway through what's in your palm of your hand. And God says, my thoughts towards you are more than all of the sand on all of the shores in the world. Wow. And you know what those thoughts are, right? Jeremiah 29, 11. Not thoughts of evil, but of peace to give you a future and hope. So God's intention and his thoughts towards us are nothing but fantastic. And so Paul calls the Roman believers and us beloved of God. We're his loved ones. That's a great provision. I'm now standing in the love of God. Wow. And then there's a fourth provision that comes. He says, we're called to be saints. Now, in the original language, the two words to be aren't there. In the original language, it literally reads called saints. Through faith in Jesus Christ, I am called a saint. 
Now, for some of you, when you hear that term saint, you think of someone who's been canonized over the history of the church, and your name has been written down through the annals of church history, and you've been awarded with a stained glass window or a statuette in some kind of cathedral, right? You get that mindset. But the Bible tells us that every single person that accepts Jesus Christ is called a saint. Can you imagine if we greeted one another? How you doing, St. Bob? Well, great, St. Pete. How you doing, St. Mary? Oh, I'm doing great, St. Betty. You know, that would be kind of weird, wouldn't it? So we would never refer to ourselves as a saint, but God does. In truth, you're either a saint or you're an ain't, right? And I don't want to be an ain't. I want to be a saint. I've been transformed. Now, the word saint literally is hagios. We get our term holy from that means set apart so god calls us his holy ones oh my goodness do you realize how much god loves us do you realize the provision of the gospel god sees us as holy now that's positionally that's judicially that means that's my standing in christ that when i've given my life to christ all of my sins are transferred nailed to the cross so now when the father sees me he sees me through christ and he sees me as righteous as holy. Oh, my goodness, right? Now, practically speaking, that's judicial righteousness. That's my standing in Christ. Now, practically, oh, I know I've got a lot of work to do, right? And we'll be talking about that as we move through the book of Romans. But I want you to see here, through faith in the gospel, God calls us saints, his holy ones. Wow. And then there's one last thing, number five, grace to you and peace, from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. The last provision I want to see is peace. I mean, we've already talked about grace, but he says we also have grace and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, Paul often couples these two terms together in his greetings. Um, We might call them the Siamese twins of the New Testament. And they're always in this order, and rightly so. Listen, before you can ever experience the peace of God, you have to experience the grace of God. you got to be born again, right? You'll, you'll never experience true peace until you've surrendered your life to Christ. Um, the famous author, H.G. Wells, he had written in his journal these words. The time has come for me to reorganize my life, my peace. I cry out. I cannot adjust my life to secure anything fruitful, no fruitful peace. Here I am, 64, still seeking peace. It's a hopeless dream, end quote. Well, he was wrong. It's not a hopeless dream. It, it's, it's a reality to the person who surrenders their life to Jesus Christ. I become a recipient of his peace, a, a peace that Philippians 4, 7 says surpasses human understanding. So my world, your world, and other people have seen other Christians go through radical things and yet have peace. How is that possible? It's God's peace. In fact, Jesus said in John 14, 27, my peace I give you. Not the world's peace, my peace I give unto you. Therefore, your heart doesn't need to be troubled or afraid. I've got the prince of peace, right? I got nothing to worry about. So one of the provisions of the gospel is God's perfect peace. So many things falling around me, but I have a peace. So here we close off, and we'll, we better close here now. Five wonderful provisions of the gospel. Grace. Oh, man, thank you for the great grace. I have apostleship. I, I, I'm one of his sent out to be light for him. I'm called beloved of God. I'm called holy. I'm called a saint. And I have his peace. Man, when you think about it, Truly, the gospel is good news for men. Now, because of all the things we've seen in these verses, there are many, I just want to close with the words of Vance Havner, who said this in regard to the gospel. We are the recipients of it. So because of that, Vance Havner said this, quote, the gospel is not a secret to be hoarded, but a story to be heralded. When you've got something that good, that significant, that life-changing, transforming, You want to tell people about it, right? So, praise Jesus. Amen. You've just heard Pastor Ron Hint and the radio ministry of Calvary Houston here on Larger Than Life. 
Pastor Ron is currently in the book of Romans. Romans is a cornerstone of understanding the Christian faith, addressing themes of sin, salvation, and God's unending grace. It's a letter that challenges and uplifts, guiding us toward a deeper relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Whether you joined us halfway through our program today or you caught just the ending, we'd encourage you to visit the link that provides this message in its entirety and other messages like this one. All you have to do is visit ltlradio.org and click on the teaching archive. Do you feel like you're constantly on the go with no time to slow down? You're not alone. And the good news is we've got you covered. You can listen to more of Pastor Ron's message by downloading our mobile app, which is available on our website, ltlradio.org. Were you aware that Larger Than Life is also in podcast form? All you have to do is subscribe. So don't leave that website without doing that. Are you in the Friendswood, Texas area? Do you have a church you call home? If not, we'd like to invite you to join our community as we worship Jesus together. Service times and directions can be found on our website, ltlradio.org. That's all the time we have for today, but we hope you join us again right here on Larger Than Life. Larger Than Life.